Uh, what is a splitting? So <clears throat> I remind you that for pretty much any kind of geometric thing that has Hochschild homology and cyclic homology, like for example, our A infinite, cyclic A infinity algebra, we can define two complexes. One of them is a Hochschild complex. which looks like Hochschild chains of A with differential B. And we have the cyclic chain complex, which looks uh, very similar to this. Uh, I'm going to write what's called the negative cyclic complex. C star of A, I join the formal power variable U uh, which is of homological degree two, and I put as differential B plus U big B. And there are formulas all over the internet for this little B and big B. Uh, little B, essentially what it does is it takes any two adjacent, uh, or two or three or four adjacent entries in a tensor and sticks one of the operations uh, of the A infinity algebra and replaces that input by the output. Um, and big B, what it does is increases the tensor degree, puts a one in the beginning and rotates the entry cyclically. Um, now, <clears throat> the homology of these two complexes is known as Hochschild cohomology or negative cyclic homology. Uh, now you can immediately see, for example, that there is a map from, um, so, this negative cyclic complex, um, let me give them numbers two and one. So two mod u is exactly equal to one. So there's always a um, map from um, the negative cyclic complex to the Hochschild, to the Hochschild complex. So you have such a map. Um, And a splitting is going to be, so this map is mod u, and the splitting is a map backwards. It's a map of chain complexes. So it has to be to satisfy two properties. So a splitting S is a backwards chain map. So chain map means that it intertwines the two differentials, little b and b plus ub. Um, so if you want s of b of a equals to b plus ub s of a. Uh, that's the first condition. The second condition is it must be a splitting. In other words, S of A must look like A plus A1 U plus A2 U squared plus and so on. In other words, the mod U, it's an, it's an, it's an inverse of, of uh, it's, it's an identity. So I'm, I'm emphasizing here that this A and this A are the same thing. So the, what the splitting does is that it associates to a Hochschild chain a sequence of Hochschild chains with powers of higher and higher powers of u, which satisfies this condition. And, but the first, the zeros one is the Hochschild chain that you started with. So this is all part of saying that it's a splitting. For us, we need one extra condition, which is not really in the language of splittings, but this is what we really need to have. So I'm going to write it like this, S of alpha, S of beta, H res equals to alpha, beta, mukai. So this is slightly more confusing where, where this comes from, but I will explain in a second. So <clears throat> basically if you have two Hochschild chains, alpha and beta, 
turns out that the Mukai pairing, I think I've told you this, exists not just at um, uh, homology level, there exists a, um, a pairing even at chain level. So for alpha and beta, any two Hochschild chains, um, the important thing is this is a number. It's in our ground field, let's call it C, right? On the other hand, this S alpha S beta, the higher residue pairing is pairing together things. Um, so if I had something that looked like alpha zero plus alpha one U plus alpha two U squared plus and so on, and beta zero plus beta one U plus and so on, the higher residue pairing would do much more. So it would take alpha zero beta zero plus something like alpha one beta zero plus alpha zero beta one u plus, and you can see where this is going. So this a priori is an element in C double bracket u. So the condition that I'm imposing, condition three, this is um, the isometry condition. says that all the higher powers of u are zero. Uh, the coefficients of all the higher powers of u in the higher residue pairing are zero. So this, I want it to be zero. And the next one also, and so on. So this is the definition of a splitting as I will, want, as I will uh, require it to be. So it's a chain map from the chain, the Hochschild chain complex to the negative cyclic chain complex. Chain map means it intertwines the differentials. It splits the natural map, which is mod U, and it respects this, the pairings on the two sides. Okay. The fact that this guy is equal to alpha beta mukai is obvious. It's part of um, condition two. The, pro the, the meaning of the statement three is that all the higher power terms are zero. Any questions about this? The reason this is important for us is because, um, as you'll see, it will help us understand um, all the constructions that are done are done in terms of vial algebra. I can do them on homology level or on um, chain level, and they, with the help of a splitting, I can identify the two results. Any questions? Let me see, I don't know how to, okay. Chat, questions, anybody? All right, no questions, good. Um, but maybe, maybe, let me just uh, make a, a statement. Um, it, is, um, it is enough to give such a splitting at homology level. So it's a, it's a map from the negative, uh, from Hochschild homology of A to negative cyclic homology of A, splitting the projection and which is an isometry with respect to the higher. So um, this is because we can always, in, in complexes of vector spaces, we can always split off the homology inside the chain complex. All right. Why is this, in the end, important for us? It's because S induces a simplectomorphism
between H Tate and the homology of L Tate, maybe with some kind of dimension shift, but let me not worry about this. So let me remind you what H was. H was the Hochschild homology of A shifted by D. And L was the Hochschild chain complex shifted by D. Uh, sorry, um, that was L, but it also carried a circle action. So L Tate was um, C star of A double bracket, uh, double Laurent bracket U, B plus UB, and with this shift by D. So why is this important? You see here I have trivial circle action. On L, I don't have trivial circle action. So S essentially trivializes a the circle action. So when I write here H date, I think about this graded vector space with trivial differential, trivial circle action. So constructing H tate just means this guy means H add formal Laurent power series of U and put zero differential. There's nothing interesting there. Here, on the other hand, to construct L tate, I do all this funky business of um, putting the, um, <coughs> the extra differential big B, which comes from the circle action on L. And when I, I remind you that L Tate naturally had a symplectic structure coming from the higher residue pairing. This one has a symplectic structure coming from the Mukai pairing. And the fact that the splitting turns the Mukai pairing into the high residue pairing is what tells me that this isomorphism is a symplectomorphism. So now, as soon as I have this, that allows me to explain how abstractly I would define the categorical gromov whitney invariance. So abstract definition And this is what was in original, Costello's original paper. So let me remind you that we had a very general construction of a, uh, whenever you gave me one of those uh, DG vector spaces with a circle action, I construct, so, when I had a DG vector space with circle action and pairing, let's call it for it. So for example, I have two such examples, H and L. In one, in H, the differential is zero, the circle action is zero, and the pairing is a Mukai pairing. That's a Hochschild homology. In L, I have the Hochschild chain dif differential. I have the circle action, which is con B differential, and I have the high residue pair. So when I have such a, so given one of these, I was doing this abstract construction where I was taking um, the Weyl algebra I was completing it with respect to some kind of H bar parameter of one of these vector spaces. So I'm gonna get something like this, or I'm going to get this other one, the homology of L Tate. Uh, I 
use my space badly. Sorry, let me erase this and But this is naturally isomorphic to the homology of WH bar of L tate. And now the important thing is that the symplectomorphism S because all the constructions just depended on the structure of a symplectic vector space. That was the input with a Lagrangian decomposition, if you wish. But for now, for this isomorphism, all I need an isomorphism of symplectic vector spaces. An isomorphism of symplectic vector spaces induces an isomorphism of Weyl algebras like this. So maybe let me call the corresponding isomorphism phi S here. And now, inside here, I have the completed sym symmetric algebra of um, H minus with parameters, sorry, with extra H bar and lambda. You might remember that this was a way to represent the Fox space. And in, in here, this projects down to the homology of the Fox space. of L tate. So we had this very abstract construction where if you gave me a, um, a symplectic vector space with a, uh, a vector space with a, cert, uh, a symplectic vector space, I could construct the Weyl algebra. And if it had a Lagrangian decomposition, I could project onto the uh, Fox space. This map is just a natural projection. And this map is the natural inclusion coming from the fact that H minus is a Lagrange. So I have this very long composition map. In here, we have constructed this, well, we have presumably constructed this element beta a. We know that there is such a guy now by the very com complicated construction that went through causal resolutions, but which morally this beta a should be the image of what should have been the string vertices if we allowed zero inputs. So somehow we had to construct a different solution of the Maher-Cartan equation in a different resolution of the original um, space. But if there was not this problem of never allowing zero inputs, we would have had this beta A long ago. Now, all what I claim is that this map is an isomorphism. And this should be obvious because essentially I'm doing Fox space constructions on both sides. So this one is an isomorphism because it, it came from a symplectomorphism. The right hand side is kind of this complicated thing which needs to take into account the big B differential and the fact that I have a non-trivial circle action. On the left hand side, the same construction just gives a symmetric algebra on H minus. So if I, um, sorry, uh, I, I need to correct myself. If I want the hom in the homology of FH bar, I need to take this element. Beta A was a solution of the maher cartan equation. And the way I went from solutions of maher cartan equations to homology classes, 
I took this x pop b beta a over h bar. Well, the definition is that this uh, potential, full descendant potential of um, the pair algebra A with splitting S is the unique, this guy is the unique element which maps to that, to, to that guy. So this is the abstract definition which can be found in Constello hidden somewhere for what the abstract full invariant potential is. You might remember that when I started the lectures, I promised to you that the full descendant potential should be an element in here. And indeed, by this whole construction, I defined this too. But unfortunately, the way this is given to us, it's completely uh, non-explicit. So the question is, how do we make stuff explicit now? So let me pause here and see if I, if there are any questions about what the, ab, the kind of, this is the definition of the categorical enumerative invariant, but um, this is the non-explicit one that can be found in Costello. Um, the real question is, how do we make this something that we can compute? Any questions? I'll pause for maybe 30 seconds because I know. Um, so you said uh, that this is unique, but the splitting will not induce any choices. Uh, what do you mean? There's many choices of a splitting. So yeah. you, you start with an A infinity algebra A and just from knowing the A infinity algebra A, you have all this right hand side. Maybe let me use a different color. Oops, sorry. This stuff here does not depend on any splitting from the a infinite, the cyclic a infinity algebra, I extract this uh, DG vector space L with a circle action and a pairing. That gives me a symplectic vector space, L tate with the Lagrangian inside it, L plus and two, two orthogonal Lagrangians, L plus and L minus. Um, from that, I have the abstract construction of the Fox space, F, F, ignore the hat and the H bar, they are just some completion things, right here. And in this guy, because of the action of the, um, uh, whoops, sorry, I don't know what this is doing. Because of the action of the, um, uh, of the moduli spaces of curves, I had a very special distinguished element in the homology of the Fox space, which was this X of beta A over H bar. So everything that's inside the red kind of uh, circumference is in the, completely independent of any splitting. It, it, it is defined and constructed completely with no splitting in mind. And I've circumvented the problem of having issues with zero inputs versus positive numbers of inputs by using some Kozul resolutions which don't even appear in this story. In this story, everything is as if I was pretending that I had, uh, I was allowed to use zero inputs. Now what the splitting does, the splitting induces a complete isomorphism but the, the actual isomorphism depends on the splitting between the green side and the red side. And the way it does it is induces, it induces an isomorphism at the level of Weyl algebras at the top here, this phi s 
depends on the splitting. And if it, if it induces a, an isomorphism at the level of symplectic vector spaces, which carries over the Lagrangian decomposition from the left side to the Lagrangian decomposition on the right side, then it will um, map the Fox space, the Fox space construction is an abstract construction, but the only inputs to it are a symplectic vector space with two orthogonal Lagrangians in it. So if I start with isomorphic input data, so I'm going to get isomorphic Fox spaces. And the Fox space at the, on the left hand side is this guy, and the Fox space on the right hand side is this guy. Here I had an element in the homology, on the right hand side, I had an element in the homology of the Fox space. Therefore, there must be an, a, a unique, well defined element in the homology of the Fox space on the left side. And that is that because there was no differentials involved, it's just a symmetric algebra on H minus. All right, so, so this element depends on the splitting. Oh, this element absolutely depends on the splitting because the way it depends on the splitting is because this isomorphism depends on S. So the element X beta A over H bar does not depend on the splitting, but I pull it back by an isomorphism which depends on the splitting. So the result will strongly depend on the splitting. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right, so unique, when I said unique here, I just meant that this map here, that the dotted arrow is an isomorphism. So there's a unique map, a unique element that maps to this once I have fixed the splitting. But it's not unique in the sense that it would not depend on the split. This is the categorical enumerative invariant. of the pair A and N. All right, um, now that we got the abstractly defined thing, we need to make it more concrete. So first of all, I will no longer work with these but with capital, uh, capital F straight S. Um, so in gromov witten theory, the relationship is always the same. D is exp of F over H bar. So this is a bijective correspondence. If you know D, you know F, and if you know F, you know D. Um, this, is the Gro this would be the gromov witten potential and this is a full descendant, whatever, this is the exponential of the potential. Um, and the relationship between them, I remind you this lemma that I told you to try to do as an exercise by yourselves, is that D is a homology class for B plus U B plus H bar delta, if and only if, F satisfies um, the quantum master equation, which was uh, B plus U B plus H bar delta F plus one half F bracket F equals to zero. So um, they are equivalent, this uh, relationship allows us to identify solutions of the quantum master equation with homology classes for this differential operator. Um, it will be more natural for us to work with the F than with the D. The reason I worked with D here is because everybody knows very well what it means to pull back homology classes under a quasi isomorphism. Um, while people understanding what it means to um, pull back solutions of the quantum master equation is maybe not so obvious, but it, it is exactly the same. There is no relation, no problem with this. 
So let's understand what we were trying to do. So we had a DGLA, which was called F of L, if you want, which consisted of the following things. Sim uh, of L minus, a joint two variables H bar and lambda, and with a differential B plus U B plus H bar delta, and a bracket operation. Okay. And in here, we had a solution, beta, uh, a solution of the, the quantum master equation, this one here. This we constructed with great effort through causal resolutions and mapping from moduli spaces of curves, but it doesn't really matter. Let's, if we call this the GLA H, we have a solution of the quantum master equation, which is the same thing as the maurer cartan equation in this DGLA. All right, our goal is to use the splitting S to trivialize H. In other words, to construct a quasi-isomorphism H isomorphic to H trivial, where H trivial is the following DGLA. It has the same exact vector space But its differential is just b plus ub, and it has zero bracket. All right. So our goal is to use s to kill off this part and this part. All right. So it's not completely inconceivable to see that this should be in principle possible is because both delta and the bracket depend on the circle action. Big B, which itself is trivialized homolo uh, homotopically, if you want, by, by the splitting S, okay? It's a bit of a mystery why we don't wanna kill off this little B, this big B as well. I will leave it to, I will leave this question for now. But you should, you should see that if we had killed also this big B, the DGLA on the left would be exactly um, a trivial DGLA with differential little b, whose homology would be just the space where we want the, uh, the abstract potential to live. It would be this. So uh, maybe it's worth pointing out that if you have zero, if you have zero bracket, the Maurer-Cartan equation is just saying that you're looking for homology classes. Okay. So, um, to be truly honest, we did not really construct this beta explicitly. So the real story is that we have the following picture. We have our DGLA H, and we had constructed a D another DGLA H hat, which was the causal resolution of H, which was Instead of having that symmetric algebra on L minus, it had HOM um, wedge K L plus sim L L minus double bracket H bar lambda with a new differential, which was B plus U B plus H bar delta plus another term iota 
and another bracket which was which we denoted by bracket h bar so it doesn't really matter how this was but this this was the resolution uh, k greater than or equal to one this was the causal resolution of h that we uh, replaced h by and here we found an honest element beta h Okay, the goal is to use the splitting to construct a quasi-isomorphism and a, a, a diagram of, of quasi-isomorphisms. This will be called K and this will be called K hat. So if we, <clears throat> if we had constructed um, such quasi-isomorphisms where H hat trivial is exactly, if you want, the same home, but differential is just B plus U, B plus iota and zero bracket. So that's before I get rid of delta and the bracket. So if I manage to construct such a commutative diagram I will have my beta a hat here. I will push it down uh, by k hat. And I could find some element in H triv in, in the Maurer Cartan space of H triv, which I would call um, 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 F. A S. If I can find something here which maps here, this will be my desired element. Because I remind you, Mar Mar Cartan elements here are nothing but homology process. All right. So now comes some combinatorics. There, it's in, it's inevitable that we get rid of combinatorics. Um, so maybe let me just say the theorem is there exist explicit quasi-isomorphisms K and K hat. Uh, making this diagram commutative. And K and K hat are L infinity algebra maps. I hope I'm not throwing too much new stuff at you at the last minute, but this is this story is exactly the same story over and over and over again after Konsevich taught us this, that when you have two um, DG Lie algebras, and you'd like to somehow, um, you, you think that they are very closely related, but, uh, and you have a Maurer Cartan element in one and you'd like to get a Maurer Cartan in the other, the way to do this is to find a quasi-isomorphism between them, but not a quasi-isomorphism in the language of DG Lie algebras, which in general might not exist, but you have the room to find a quasi isomorphism in the language of L infinity algebras. There are way more L infinity algebras maps than just DGLA maps. Um, this is what Konsevich used in his deformation quantization paper, and this is what we're using here. We have this. And infinity algebras which have non-trivial bracket and we are managing to construct a quasi-isomorphism as L infinity algebra maps between those non-abelian non Lie algebras and some abelian Lie algebras but up to homotopy in other words it's an L infinity algebra map. So 
let me just give a very rough description of how these maps are. These maps are described completely explicitly. So let me give you an idea for H, for example. So I'm going to discuss the map K, K not K hat. So what is an L infinity algebra map? An L infinity algebra map, K is really a sequence, an infinite sequence of maps, um, which looks something like um, sorry, I had let me just write it down. They look like it's a it's a sequence of maps K M from sim L minus double bracket H bar tensor M to sim L minus double bracket H bar. So you need to remember that a an L infinity map is not just one map. It's a sequence of maps which take more and more inputs from here and always produce inputs uh, in here, uh, outputs in here. All right? So each one of these KMs will be described by a sum over um, what are called stable graphs. with M vertices. I'm not going to give you the full definition, but it's something like this. So let's look at the first map, K1. The map K1 is, you need to understand stable graphs with, um, with uh, one vertex. What's a stable graph, first of all? A stable graph is an unoriented graph where at each vertex you associate an extra integer, which is the genus of that vertex. And um, you um, allow yourself legs. And the condition is that um, the number of legs at each vertex must be greater than three if the genus is zero, things of that sort. So let's look at the map K1, for example. K1 will have graphs that look like this in it. Or actually, let me draw it with exactly four legs so that it's a, something with four inputs. Or I could have something like this with one loop or something like this with two loops and so on. So K1 will come from the contributions of these graphs. Now the question is, whenever you give such formulas with graphs, the important thing is you need to tell me what the propagator is. The propagator is what you attach on on, on full edges. And the propagator in this case is an operator which we call H, capital H. And I need to tell you what capital H is. There's a formula for it. H depends on S, on the splitting S. Let me not tell you the formula, it's in the paper. It's some kind of messy formula combinatorial formula. But the important thing what H does is H is a bounding homotopy for omega. Now, uh, let me go back to stuff. There's so much notation in this story that uh, I need to remind you what this is. Omega for two Hochschild chains, alpha and beta, was defined to be the pairing of B alpha and beta. And this omega, uh, sorry, 
alpha and beta are in L minus. So in other words, alpha and beta look like alpha zero plus u alpha one plus and so on. And beta is in the same way. So I only take the zeros coefficients of them, I apply big B to one of them and pair it with the other one. This was kind of the crucial ingredient in the definition of delta. The delta operator, the h bar delta that we had here, um, was defined in terms of omega. It was something like delta of x1, x2, and so on, xn, is just summation of omega xi, xj, and then I exclude xi and xj from this, right? So when I tell you that H is a bounding homotopy for omega, this, this is exactly what it means. It means that B plus U big B, co the commutator with this operator H is omega. So H itself is an operator that goes from two copies of L minus into K, into the ground field, just like omega. It's just that it has one extra homological degree and it um, um, uh, it the boundary of it is omega. So how should you think about this H? The important thing about this H is to think of it as this is a proof that omega, so also delta, is trivial. Homo is homologically trivial. Right? Because if you have an operator which is the which is which is itself the boundary of another operator, then in homology it must induce z the, the zero operator. Okay, so somehow what I have done is I had my circle action that was trivialized by, by little s and using it, I've constructed another operator H by some formula that I, I really don't wanna give you, but it's very similar to something that appears in given Tal's papers. Um, the inspiration comes from there. The property is that this H is a, is a is a proof that omega is homologically trivial. It's not just saying, I know that omega is trivial in homology, because of course, B being trivial in homology would mean that omega is trivial in homology. But I need to have something that proves to me this, and this is my proof. Okay, so now, what I do is every time I see on a, a, a full edge of the graph, I'm gonna put this operator H on it. So the map K1, now you can see what this is. I'm, I'm going to um, just tell you there are some coefficients, some weights associated with this graph. This is one, this is one half and so on. So K1 turns out to be exp of H. So this, uh, and maybe let me, yeah, let me call it delta H, the operator that's extended by linearity to the um, uh, symmetric algebra, to, buy, to make it a differential operator on the symmetric algebra. But you can see that this looks exactly like exp of delta H, which is really the first map in a sequence of quasi-isomorphisms. All right, and then the map, K, the map K2 will involve graphs with two vertices. And so on. So 
I'm not telling you all the details here, but you should be able to see in principle how the map K is defined. The map K is not as important as for us for the formulas as the map K hat. And I'm gonna spend the last five minutes of my talk explaining what the map K hat involves. I explained the map K, K just because it's much easier to explain, but um, now I can give you the, um, the full um, idea behind the map K hat. I need to replace stable graphs where edges were unoriented. labeled by this operator H with something else which we, we call partially directed stable graphs. By the way, this is all in the second paper, just me and Juno. So what's a partially directed stable graph? Let me give you the main idea. So you start with a bunch of vertices I'll, I'll do a definition by example. Start with a bunch of vertices. You first of all put some genus on them. So you put some number, g equals to one, g equals to seven, g equals to three, g equals to zero. You put also a bunch of leaves at some of those vertices, maybe three of them, but you direct the leaves. Some of them are incoming, some of them are outgoing. All right? So now stuff can be directed. The next thing you do is you draw a spanning tree. And we tend to draw this in blue. You draw a tree on this, on these vertices. So if you don't know what a spanning tree is, uh, well, I'm doing things in reverse. I normally I would need to have a graph first and then choose a spanning tree. But now let's say I, I'm just starting, I'm drawing a tree. And I direct this tree, the, the edges in this tree any way I want. Next, I, allow myself to add some vertices. Maybe let's, uh, let's have one more black vertex to explain this. Well, let's say I have one more vertex here and I have a, another blue edge here. Next, I allow myself to add directed edges. Those are gonna be drawn in, in blue, in, in black but that can only go downstream along the tree. So I can add extra edges, but they can only go flow down in the same direction as, uh, as the tree. So I can add an edge like this. I can add an edge like this, but I am not allowed to do an edge like that. This guy is not allowed because it's not going downstream in, a tree, in the tree. All right, finally, once we have that, we're allowed to add some undirected edges any way we want. We can add loops, we can add directed edges like this, and so on, uh, undirected edges. So this is what uh, a uh, partially directed stable graph is. And the requirements are, uh, this is not yet a stable graph. Um, the requirements are each vertex has at least one incoming directed half edge. So you saw that the, the problem was this vertex here that I'm this one here, before I added this arrow, it did not have any incoming directed half edges. Um, and we require, again, stability at each vertex, right? 
And then what I do is I evaluate this against this, these types of graphs. Um, what does it mean? I need to tell you the propagators again. Everything else is standard. So the way I evaluate here is I put on, ah, I need to tell you some more operators. So first of all, the undirected edges will carry the same operator H as before. The incoming edges will carry um, operators R and the outgoing operators will carry operators T. Let me just give them names and I'll tell you what each thing is. So this will be a T, this will be an R. The directed edges have the operator F and uh, those in the spanning tree and those outside of the spanning tree have the operator S. And now I need to tell you what all of those are. So R first of all was the splitting. That was the um, map from chains of A to chains of A double bracket U given by the splitting. Uh, sorry, I take this back. Um, I was extended U linearly. So let me put the correct differentials here. This would be plus here. So if I had my original splitting, I can extend it U linearly to give, get this. Sorry about uh, running out of time. Okay, is it okay if I go another five minutes? Okay. T is the inverse map. Why? So that's not too bad. Um, what is the operator S? S is a very simple operator. S goes from uh, L minus to L plus, shifted by one. It's an even operator uh, given by S of alpha equals to U B alpha zero. So this is, you should think about this as turning an input into an out, uh, turning an output into an input with a circle action. So graphically, it looks like sewing one end of this with a circle action. Finally, what is F? F is a bounding homotopy. for S. Of course, because S is in, involves a circle action, we can hope to bound it. So in other words, B plus U big B, F is equal to S. So if you don't follow all the details, don't worry too much about it. <coughs> you, we are going to be studying summing over all directed ribbon graphs of this sort some kind of Feynman sum with um, where the leaves are labeled by these operators. We have T, R, F, H, and S. They are explicitly determined in terms of the splitting and they um, give you um, these uh, sums. So let, instead of kind of going into more details, let me try to explain for the last two minutes what happens in some explicit formulas. So let's say I was trying to understand the genus one, n equals to one formula, which really means, um, let me do k equals to one, l equals to zero. So I need to look at graphs. So I need to look at these partially directed stable graphs where the total genus is one. The total genus means the sum of the 
genera of the vertices plus the um, number of loops essentially in the graph. I need to have one input, one in, zero out. So let's see. Turns out that there's only two choices. So if I take this graph, where the vertex is labeled by genus one, it has one input, zero outputs. And the other option is for this to be labeled by genus zero and to have a loop. Okay, I remind you that loops increase the genus. Okay, so what does this tell me about the F110? AS. So if I'm trying to calculate the genus one, one, in, one input, well, it's supposed to be the following thing. First of all, at each vertex, I label with the corresponding beta hat. So here I have beta hat one, one, zero. Why? Because I have one input, zero outputs, and genus one. Here, I'm gonna label with beta hat zero, that's a genus, one input, two outputs. And turns out that the there's a bit of a combinatorial coefficient This takes a one half here. All right, so what, do, what am I supposed, what does that really mean? What is this F110 of AS? This is supposed to be a homomorphism from um, L wedge one L plus into sim zero L minus. That's a reasonable thing. So, um, and how is this defined? It's supposed to be this beta hat one one zero plus so if I want to know what this evaluated on something on alpha is, it's beta one one zero of alpha, that's gonna be a number. Plus, I'm supposed to take delta H, that's what this edge calculates, of beta zero to one two of alpha and with the one half. So the combinatorial coefficients, I haven't told you anything about where they come from, but there's some formulas for them. So I want to show you that these are very explicit formulas. So what that means is that um, these guys we have computed by means of the Kozul resolutions and um, themselves have been computed as the images of some ribbon graphs that were, that were calculating string vertices. And now um, this is the one, one, zero invariant. You give me something to input into the string vert, into the Gromovitan invariants of genus one with one input. And I'm calculating this complicated expression and that should be the answer. This delta H is where the splitting goes. And morally, what you should think about is that what, what this morally does is it takes the, the moduli space of M11 bar, it draws a little circle around the cusp point and splits the integral into two pieces over M11 bar. This term corresponds to the integrating along the, here. This term would give me something that would correspond to something around this circle. And this delta H is a way for me to fill in this circle. So that's the moral is that the integral over all of M11 bar has been somehow split off into an integral over the complement of a little disk around the boundary 
and something that filled in the boundary. And in higher genera, there will be more uh, things. Maybe let me give you one more example of a formula to um, give you something that, so for example, the one, one, one invariant, which goes into the construction of the one, two part of the Grobin invariants, will have among other terms, things that look like this. So it's gonna have a blue arrow here and a black arrow here. And it will also have something that looks like this. Where this is directed, oops, it should have been blue, but it doesn't matter. Um, All right, so maybe let me not um, um, go much further into the formulas. I can say a little bit more maybe in the discussions about how you find the splittings, but I think this is as good as it will get uh, in terms of explaining where the various formulas come from. Let me stop here. Thank you.